So we're going to look at the book of 2 John, uh, right near the end of your Bible, second shortest book in the Bible. John pens this little letter, and in it, John, well, we know John, he walked with Jesus, he was one of his disciples, and he loves Jesus. And he, he followed Jesus, and Jesus meant everything to him. But some people were coming to this church that John is writing to, and they were preaching a different Jesus. They're saying things that weren't true about who Jesus was, and John was deeply concerned about that, and he wanted the people to know the truth about Jesus, because as they know the truth about Jesus, then their lives would fall in line with him. Now, we've all seen different movies and read books with that sort of theme, where you learn the truth about your father, and then that changes everything, and you, you become, you take on his mission. Just this week, I read one of my kids' books that I bought for Christmas, and I snatched it and read it up. And it was a fictional story based on true events about the first guy who wanted to climb the Matterhorn. And uh, everyone in his village called him a lunatic. He was a great mountain guide, but they said, impossible, the Matterhorn can never be climbed. We can't summon it. They called, him, they called him suicidal. They called him crazy and everything else. But he set off on his mission and he took one of his clients up the mountain and they both perished on the mountain. And everyone, that confirmed it to everyone. This mountain can never be climbed. But as this guide's son grew up, he began to hear the truth about his father. That he wasn't just some crazy fanatic taking unnecessary risks. But he had this dream to climb this mountain. And the, son, the father's heart was to be a guide, to protect his clients, to be able to care for them, to be able to, his main priority was the safety of his clients. And so the son began to learn the truth as the story unfolded that as he was on the mount, his father was on the mountain with his client, his client got injured. And so rather than going to the summit, which he could have easily done, he gave up his dream of being the first on top of the Matterhorn in order to rescue his client. And in doing so, they got stuck on the mountain overnight and a storm came in and they both perished. Well, the son, knowing the truth about his father, that he was all about protecting his client, when he grew up, he wanted to climb the Matterhorn. And then, of course, his client gets injured. And he has to care for his client and give up his dream of standing on the summit. But everyone honored this boy as a hero, and they said, he is his father's son. That's what John wants as he's writing this letter, 2 John. He wants the church to know Jesus, to know the truth about Jesus because he cares so deeply about that so that we can become like our father's son. We can become like Jesus. And truth is one of the big themes in this book. And here we have John who loves Jesus so deeply. In the book of 1 John, he starts off his letter by saying, this is what we've heard from the beginning. We've heard, we've seen with our eyes, we've looked at, our hands have touched concerning this word of life concerning Jesus. He'd walked with Jesus, he knew Jesus intimately, and John knew Jesus so much, and so John's defining characteristic became that of love. Because John knew Jesus and the truth about Jesus, his defining characteristic was love. But as John's writing this letter, there are some who've come to deceive some who are saying Jesus didn't really come into the flesh, it come in the flesh, and they're saying things that aren't true about Jesus. And one particular fellow who we read in the history books is Serinthus. And he and his band of people were an early form of Gnosticism. And they were saying, we've got a superior knowledge. We have this elite revelation from God. And we know all about these things because we're progressive thinkers. Serenthus and his others, they were saying the whole material world is bad and the spiritual world is good. So Jesus, the Christ, couldn't have had a physical body because the physical body is something that's bad. So they said, well, Jesus, he wasn't born of a virgin. He was just a regular guy. And then the spiritual Christ descended on this man, Jesus, at his baptism and did all the miracles. And then before the cross, he left him. Because he, the spiritual Christ, which is superior, didn't want to be part of this physical death. And so they were saying all sorts of things that weren't true about Jesus. And in doing so, they became the aristocrats of the church. We're above all the others. Everyone else is this subclass of Christians, this lower group of Christians. And so their defining characteristic became of that of pride. 
and harshness of saying we're better than everyone else. And so as John's writing, truth and love are becoming the main themes of his letter. And he defines truth not in just simple way of here's his exact definition of truth, but truth is all about knowing the right things. He wants us to know the right things about Jesus, but more than just knowing the right things, he defines truth as all about the person of Jesus. When John uses the word truth, he's encapsulating the entire Christian message. Just like when Paul uses the word gospel, he's talking about the full or message of the birth and the death and the life and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus. And so John, in talking about truth, uses that word to encapsulate the entire Christian message. Jesus is truth incarnate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so, let's begin to read this letter together. He says, The elder, to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not I only, but all who know the truth, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Father's Son, will be with us in truth and love. It's given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we've had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. And as you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. We'll finish reading the book next week. I don't mind if you read ahead all week and study up on it. But uh, this is the part we're going to focus in on this week. And John introduces himself as the elder. Um, there's a lot of elders. The other apostles would have been considered elders. They're kind of, it's just the term for someone who's older. It's a term of respect. It's a term of endearment. And John didn't really have to introduce specifically who he was because he was the elder and they all knew it. When we were living in Tanzania, mze was the word for elder, and you called everyone an mze. It was a term of respect, it was a term of endearment, and you'd go to someone's house and you'd say, oh, how's mze doing, meaning kind of the, the older people in the household. And although it was a term that could be used of almost anyone, especially people older than you, when I phone back to the village in Tanzania now, and I ask, how's mze doing, they all know one particular person that I'm talking about. Partly because he's the oldest in the village, he's got a prominent family and he's a leader in the area, but also the personal connection that my family has with his family. So when I say, how is the old elder doing, they all know the exact person I'm talking about. And here John didn't have to say, okay, I'm John, he just had to say, I'm the elder. And they all knew he was talking about because they all loved him dearly and he loved the churches dearly and they had this personal connection with one another. And he's writing to the chosen lady and her children. There's some debate, is this a specific lady or is it just the church personified with its church members? But he's referring to them as family. And this lady and her children and he's the elder and so there's this personal connections, it's family terms. And as he writes, he's saying to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in the truth and not only I but all who know the truth. And then he goes on in verse 4 and he talks about it's given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth. And he closes the letter with saying he's going to come and visit so that it will complete his joy. He says the same thing in 1 John. He says the same thing in 3 John. He wants the joy to be complete. And as he sees his children walking in the truth, he's got great joy. And then as he sees the deceivers come and some are falling away from who Jesus is and their lives are being changed by that, he wants to come and visit and kind of set them straight so that his joy can be complete. I'm sure you've experienced the same sort of thing. When you have a personal connection with people and they walk in your values, you have great joy. Just think of Christmas this last week, especially parents and grandparents. You'd know this. Your children, are they walking in the values of your family? It gives you great joy. Have they turned away from what the family's all about and kind of gone their own way and turned their back on the family? Doesn't it give you a great heartbreak? Because you want so much more for them and it breaks your heart. And here we see John writing this letter and when his children are walking in the truth, it gives them great joy. 
And when they're not walking in the truth, he wants to come and help them and teach them so they can walk in the truth to complete his joy so that he doesn't have that heartbreak. And so walking in the truth is what this letter is all about. And as we walk in the truth, it leads us to a great joy, but not just a great joy in myself, but a great joy together as a family. And this great joy together isn't just because of their personal connections. It's because of their identity, who they belong to. He says right here um, in verse 1, I, he's writing to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in the truth. And not only, and not I only, but also all who know the truth. So all who know the truth are united together. They're in this together. You know the truth? Well, I don't really even personally know you, maybe, but I love you in the truth because we share that same identity. Have you ever traveled? Maybe you've backpacked across some crazy continent somewhere and you're waiting in a train station and everything's unfamiliar and then you look ahead of you and you see a backpack and it's got a Canadian flag on it and you just go, aha, a fellow Canadian. And although you're shy and you don't normally step out of your comfort zone and go and talk to strangers, next thing you know you're sitting beside that person and you're talking about all the good old Canadian ways and then next thing you know you're traveling with that person because you've got this shared identity. You're in this together. You're in a foreign area, but you're both Canadian, and so you're drawn together. Or maybe you've been in a restaurant, and you overhear someone talking about Jesus, or you're in a park, and you see someone reading the Bible. And it's, it's almost like a family reunion, because you're like, hey, I've got the same Jesus. And I guess it is a family reunion, because we're a family together, all who know the truth, and all who walk in the truth. We have a shared identity, and we're together. Truth draws us together. That's what truth does. As we walk in the truth, it unites us, it brings us together, and it builds us up. Next week, we're going to look at when people don't walk in the truth, and how that divides, how it exposes lies. But as we walk in the truth, truth unites us, and it builds us together, and it fills us with a great joy together. And so that's kind of how John is beginning this message. Um, just laying the groundwork of we're in this together and I love you because of the truth and that's my heart for us here at Emmanuel is that we love one another in the truth because we've got a shared identity this is your family this is where we belong this is where we're accepted and although we're a huge family and it's not possible for you to know everybody here there are people you can get to know through small groups and different events and the people that sit around you. And as you look around, maybe there's someone that you haven't met or you're like, I'm sure I've met you and I don't remember your name. Well, we've got this shared identity and so we can step out of our comfort zone and say, I'm sorry, I forget your name and strike up a conversation and be gracious with one another because we're a people who love. We're united in the truth. We belong together because we share this truth that's in us. And so as we walk in the truth, we've got a great joy together as family. The verse carries on in verse, in verse 2. It says, because of the truth which lives in us and will be with us forever. It's an amazing statement, really. The truth lives in us. The Bible has all sorts of different ways of describing this, the truth in us. It's Christ in us. Jesus has spent his Holy Spirit to live with us. Um, we are Christians. The, the, um, later on in verse 9, he says, and anyone who walks in these commands, he has the Father and he has the Son. We belong to the Father and the Son and they're part of our lives. The truth is in us. And as we walk in this truth of Jesus, it leads us to become more like Jesus because the truth of Jesus is in us. It changes who we are. It forms us. Sometimes I just kind of take it for granted. Oh yeah, the truth is living in me. That's great. I've known that for a long time. Jesus is in me and he's, he's in my life. But let's not take that for granted. I love to remind myself of kind of the mega story starting with creation and then the fall, moving into redemption and finally the restoration, the, the unfolding of all of history, the creation where God created Adam and Eve in his image and he walked with them daily in the garden. God is truth. All of truth is defined around who God is and what he is like. And so Adam and Eve, they walked with God, they walked in the truth and they, that's what they knew. 
And then the fall happened. The devil whispered a lie about God. And he said, did God really say this? And behind every sin, there's a lie about God. Did you hear that? Behind every sin, there's a lie about God. And as we, as we see that Adam and Eve, they exchange the truth of God for a lie, as the language of Romans tells us, rather than knowing that God is good and he cares for us and wants us to be satisfied, they had this doubt, is God really good? Can we have this self-betterment plan if we eat from this fruit that he told us not to? They exchange the glory of God for lesser things. And behind every truth, and behind every sin, is a lie. And so they bought into that lie, and in buying into that lie, they were separate from God. They didn't know the truth, and they couldn't know the truth, because now they were living in a lie. And then throughout the Old Testament, God is preparing the way for the hero of the story to come. The redemption. The one who's going to come and free us from that lie. And as Jesus arrives on the scene, he is the truth. He is truth incarnate. And um, Jesus is the one who reveals the Father so that we can know the truth. Jesus is the one that sets us free from the lie that we've bought into. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And so Jesus exposes the lies that we've lived. With his own life, he paid to set us free from the empty promises that the lies offer. And isn't that what sin always does, is it promises us so much, but it doesn't deliver because it's a lie. And Jesus come, came to set us free from the empty promise of those lies. And as he set us free from that, we've been redeemed, we've been brought back to the Father so that we can be reconciled to him, so that the truth could live in us, so that we could have power over sin, because the truth is in us. And then one day we look forward for the restoration of all things. In verse 2 of 2 John, it tells us the truth is going to be with us forever. Not just now, but it's a security. The truth is with us forever. And in 1 John 3 verse 2, it tells us that when Christ appears, we're going to be like him for we shall see him as he is. And Jesus, Jesus is going to come. He's going to do away with the presence of sin and all of those lies. And when we see him, we're going to be like him. The truth in us changes who we are. It gives us a new identity. It forms us as God's children. And because it changes who we are, who we are determines what we do. Who we are comes from who God is and what he has done for us. God is love and he sent his son to love us and to buy us for himself. And so then we're children of God. And so who we are, our identity, determines what we do. Because we're children of God, loved by a loving father, we love. We become more and more like Jesus. 2 Corinthians tells us, um, 3 verse 18 tells us, as we behold the glory of the Lord, we're transformed into the same image of him. And Romans 8, 29 tells us that we're predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. That's really what the Christian walk is all about. As we glorify God by becoming more like Jesus, he formed us into his image, and now we're being recreated moment by moment, day by day, to become more and more like Jesus. And it's an exciting journey to know that the truth is living in us, and so we've been freed in the past through what Jesus has done on the cross from the penalty of sin. That's done. It's secure. Now the truth is living in us. And now currently, day by day, we're being freed from the power of sin in our lives because the truth is living in us and it's conforming us into the image of his son. And we look forward to that day when one day we'll be freed from the presence of sin and we'll be with Jesus forever. And so just as the boy on the Matterhorn knew the truth about his father, that his father was all about protecting his clients and rescuing them. He became his father's son and he walked in his father's footsteps. He took on his father's mission. And us, when we know the truth of Jesus and the love that he is and that he has, we're going to be conformed to become more and more like Jesus. And we pray for you as a church family. That that's what we are. Is we're conformed more and more to become like Jesus. 
And that's really where the heart of this letter is going to take us in, in the instructional part in the next few verses, is that as we walk in the truth of Jesus, we're going to love like Jesus. To, because be, to become like Jesus, his primary characteristic is that of love. And so, let's read verse 4 to 6 again. He says, as it's given me great joy to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as the Father commanded us. And now, dear lady, I'm not writing you a new command, but one we've had from the beginning. I ask that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk in obedience to his commands. As you have heard from the beginning, his command is that you walk in love. And so, as John is writing this, I think he's given a bit of a sideways glance towards these deceivers, towards guys like Serenthus who have come and they're saying, you know what, Jesus didn't really come in the flesh. We've got this superior knowledge. We've achieved this higher state of spiritual experiences. And John is writing and he's like, I'm not coming with a new command because they're all about being progressive thinkers. And John says, it's not this new stuff. I'm taking you back to the old, the steady. The oldest command there is to love. All of the law is summed up in this. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And so John's not writing a new command of just like those deceivers were doing of, oh, we've got this new thinking, come and listen to us. He's saying, no, I've got this old command and the old command is this. Love one another. And then he wants to define what love is a little bit. And he says, to love is to walk in obedience to the commands. And then he goes, well, what are the commands? The commands are to love. So what is love? It's to walk in obedience to the commands. And the commands are love. And all of a sudden, you've got this circle going of the commands are to love, and to love is to follow the commands, which, in essence, are to love. And that, that boggles my mind a little bit. But I think he's really just trying to simplify everything to saying, you want to follow the law? You want to obey the commands? It's all about love. It's all about love. That's what it comes down to because our actions and our lives stem from who God is and what he's done for us. And God is love. And so all of his commands are about love. Now, as humans, we tend to go to one extreme or the other. And John's tying truth and love together here. And the pendulum will swing where people will write books about God's love and he cares for us and he doesn't really care if we don't believe the right things or live the right way because he's just loving and love's going to cover over everything and it's okay. And so when we get this watered down message of who God is, we swing over and we say, no, it's about the truth. We need to know the right things about who God is and we need the right thinking. And then if truth is without love, it can easily become harsh. And it can, it can become proud. Truth without love is really only a half-truth because there's never truth without love. It's a thinly disguised lie. So the very notion of truth without love really is as far from truth as it can possibly get. Declaring the truth in an unloving, in an unloving way is an assault on what truth itself is because the fruit of truth will always produce love. But on the other hand, love without truth isn't really love at all. It's just a fickle thing. It's where it's self-serving because I'll love if it just makes sense to me. If we happen to be compatible, if I like you, if circumstances are right, well, then I'll love. And it can become self-serving and it can be self-loving. That's not the kind of love like Jesus has. The kind of sacrificial love, the kind of self-giving, humble, compassionate, 1 Corinthians 13 kind of love. Love is embodied, love embodied is really the sacrifice of Jesus. And so love without truth is just a mushy, sentimental, self-exalting, fickle kind of love. Truth and love have to go together. And so it's not that we just need a balance either. Well, I'll be partly loving and partly true. Let's just kind of strike a balance in the middle. No, it's we want to grow in our truth and our right understanding of who God is and the right doctrine so that we are grounded in the truth. And that truth will promote and produce an amazing, abundant, self-sacrificing, extreme love. We don't want to 
just balance. We want to be extreme on both ends of a very clear truth of who God is. Because as John was writing this letter, remember who John is and how he walked with Jesus, how he knew Jesus, how his life was changed by Jesus. And he knew Jesus. And so when others were coming and saying, no, nah, that's not what Jesus is like, John puts his foot down and says, no, this is the truth about Jesus. And then he has the extreme love of Jesus saying, and that truth of knowing who Jesus is, because that's how John defines truth based on who Jesus is, is expressed in love. Often, I'm unclear in my mind on, well, having all the right thinking, what does that do to produce love? Because we can think the right ways, but we don't always see that produce itself in love. And John's very concerned that people think the right way about Jesus and have a right doctrine about him. It really became clear to me just a couple of weeks ago. There's a couple of guys I meet with Thursday mornings to look at the Bible together and to sharp each other, sharpen each other in our Christian walks. We were reading through Philippians and in chapter 1 verse 9, Paul prayed, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you can be discerning and be able to judge well. And as a group of guys, we'd we'd been discovering, okay, what's this passage saying and how is it speaking? What's it trying to get at? And we got stumped a little bit on why does love have to grow in knowledge and depth of insight so that it produces good judgment? So kind of set that side aside for a little bit. And we talked about love in our own lives. And it's easy to talk about the people you love, but sometimes there's people that we don't love. And so we talked about, well, some of those people that are irksome, hard to get along with. Maybe you're at work and this important client's coming into the door and one of your colleagues goes and they meet him at the door and it's that particular colleague that you've got a really hard time with. Maybe they're overbearing or socially inept or just have a hard time connecting well with people and they're being loud and flamboyant talking to the client that you want to meet with and you're just getting chewed up inside because they're ruining it and they're setting the wrong tone here. So finally when that client comes to you, you feel like you have to undo all that person's mistakes and kind of set the tone right and this is what we're all about and you go and you correct it all. Well, as we kind of laid that scenario out, and we all had different specific people that we were having hard times with that looked sort of the same way, we asked ourselves, okay, that's our action, the unloving, irksome, I've got to fix all of this kind of thing. And as we meet as a group, we always ask four questions. Who is God? What has he done through Jesus? Who has that formed us to be? And what do we do because of that? So well, what we do We looked at, well, what we shouldn't be doing is we weren't loving, we weren't patient, we weren't gracious. And so what does that say about who we think we are? And as I kind of explained my scenario, the guys were saying, you think you're the man. It's all up to you. And if you can control things and if you can talk to people and if you can do everything just right, then everyone will come on board and you'll be able to win them over. I'm like, I guess I kind of do think that about myself. And they're exposing my heart. My love was coming out of my view of who I am. Well, my view of who I am, my identity is formed from what Jesus has done for me. So if the view of who I am is I'm the man and it's all up to me, what does that say about what Jesus has done for me? Well, well, maybe Jesus has died on the cross to save the wise people of this world. And the foolish people of this world, well, it kind of pushes them to the side and wants to kind of help them become a little bit better. But us wise people, Jesus really wants to help us out. So that's what he's done. And so if that's what Jesus has done, what does that say about the very character and nature of God? Really, he's all about us and it's whatever we need. God help me with this and God help me with that. And he's a self-betterment God who will grant our wishes and... After we talked like that and kind of exposed our hearts, we had some repenting to do. It started with just a small one, kind of irked by someone and I don't really love them. But as the truth of the scriptures began to unfold before our eyes, and we looked, we began to look again at Paul's prayer that we were studying, I pray that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you'll be able to judge well. We said, wow. 
how have I been judging that person that I don't love? It's been a very worldly kind of way. But how should I judge them? I should know that God is the supreme God. He's sovereign over all else. Everything's done for his glory. And out of love, he sent Jesus for all people, for the wise and for the foolish. But God's got a special heart for the weak and for the, the needy and for the lost of this world. And so when I look at the people I have a hard time loving and I see them through the eyes of Jesus, it changes everything. And when I see my own identity, that I was lost and now I'm found, I was dead and now I'm alive, it's going to change how I love. And so the knowledge that we have about who God is and what he's done and who he's formed us, as we walk in that truth, it's going to affect our actions. So as a group, we repented together and we preached the gospel to each other, reminding us of the, the sovereignty and the love of God over everything else and how he's formed us. And it was really neat to see how the truth of the scriptures became alive and changed our actions. And so walking in the truth of Jesus leads us to love like Jesus. We want to know the right doctrine about Jesus. We don't just want this wishy-washy, well, Jesus is all about love, so let's just put our Bibles aside and go off and love people. It's not going to have any backbone. It's not going to be grounded. And we don't want to just say, well, let's just focus on the truth. And people, they'll, they'll come later, but let's just focus on the truth. It can easily become harsh. It can easily put us just like those early Gnostic teachers of, we've got this superior knowledge and we know more of the truth than you do and everyone who doesn't know as much of us are this subclass of people and it can become a harsh thing. We want truth and love to grow together. We want to walk in the truth of Jesus because that leads us to love like Jesus. And so, John's written this letter. We're going to look again at the next half next week on kind of the question, okay, if people are speaking against the truth and they're not promoting a right Jesus, what's the loving thing to do? And we'll look at that next week. But for today, I just want to remind us that as we walk in the truth of Jesus, it leads us to great joy together as a family. That's who we are. We're a family of believers. And as we build each other up and as we're connected in love and in truth together, it's going to fill us with a great joy. As we walk in the truth of Jesus, it leads us to become more like Jesus. It changes us who we are at the core because what has Jesus has done? He's taken away the lies that we've believed and he fills us with the truth so that the truth is in us. And so it changes our identity, which is going to change our actions. And the primary action that's going to be changed is to love. Walking in the truth of Jesus leads us to love as Jesus loved. And so... Let's pray together, and as we pray, just in your own heart, pray and ask God to reveal truth to you so that you can love as Jesus loved. God, we thank you for your word, how it exposes our hearts, how it speaks to us. Thank you for Jesus, who is truth. And I pray that we cling to Jesus that we look to him, that we grow in him, that we understand him more and that we love him more. We walk in obedience to his commands, which are to love one another. As a church family, I pray that we'll be a, a group of people here who love each other and teach us how to be able to set aside ourselves so that we can have that sacrificial love that Jesus had. We pray this in your name. Amen.